Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Got a great stream with a great guest. I think you're really going to enjoy. We're going to be talking about a topic that I think for a lot of people is really near and dear to kind of their political ideology and the way that they understand the world. But my buddy, academic agent, has been talking about this a lot recently, and he's someone who's incredibly knowledgeable in the area, so I wanted to bring him on. He's a YouTuber, he's an author, just had his book, uh, Populist Delusion, to come out last year. It's excellent. You should check that out. Academic Agent, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Aaron, and uh, I, I feel very trendy with your cool outrun intro and <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not as cool as I'm not as cool as Alron, as you'll find we're, out very quickly. Um, we're, we're on the bleeding edge over here of culture. Actually, <laughs> yeah. I just, I just wanted to say, um, you know, for those people who don't know me, uh, a little bit about my, I guess, background before coming to my current views. You know, I was broadly speaking on the free market end of things. Um, I. Not yet. I mean, you know, I went to the Mises Institute. You know, I took part in the. Uh, I had various scholarships. Uh, I got an, a, a two FA Hayek awards, and wrote a book called "The Defenders of Liberty," essentially uh, defending the free market. Uh, back in uh, it was a couple of years ago now. I think it came out in uh, 2020 that book, but uh, I wrote it a couple of years before that. There's usually a lag with these things, um, so. The reason I'm putting that up front is is because when you present these sort of arguments, um, in my experience, some people who are libertarians will accuse you of kind of not knowing the material. Um, you know, I've read all of human action. Uh, not only that, I've published on human action. Um, or, I don't know, I, I wrote about the Manchester School. Uh, I, even, I even wrote about uh, the little lone London School in that book, Uh um uh, econ economists people have long forgotten like um you know uh hut and um no many others we don't need to get into them at all edwin canan and, <laughs> um it, you know so i was pretty like to say i was pretty into economics and free market e economics would be uh, an understatement um and i'm still uh, a member of various free market groups, including uh, the IEA uh, here in London, which some people may have heard of. Um, and I'm still friendly with the guys from the Muse Institute as well. But um, I have always been a realist, first and foremost, uh, Aaron, and rather than an idealist or somebody who like, stands for like some abstract ideal, like, like freedom or something like that. And when you look at the real world and you look at the facts in front of you, it's very difficult to maintain. Um, in fact, I think it's very difficult to maintain a kind of absolute free market position in the face of the reality we've all lived through in the past few years. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to go through these points one by one, but I mean, the, you know, when we're in 20, it's, it's 2023 now, um, when we're in this sort of era and you see guys from, you know, Reason Magazine or the Cato Institute or some other Koch brothers funded think tank calling uh, Ron DeSantis evil because he dared sanction Disney. <laughs> right. Uh, no, yeah. it's not just it's not just tap the sign out on. It's like, what's going on here? These people are meant to be like, this is what we're for now. We're for the rights of uh, the rights of like massive public companies like Disney to uh, just have carte blanche to do what they want to children. Um, so I, I, I actually think that uh, it, it's quite difficult to maintain that absolutist libertarian position in the, just in the face of the reality that we live in. Um, and what I'm hoping to do uh, on this show is basically just to um, – remind people of some of those things, regardless of if they're free marketeers or not, or if they're conservatives, wherever they're coming from. I just think that uh, we have to address the situation as it really is today. And I think one of the problems on our side in general is that far too many people just, they live on copium, you know, they, they just live on cope. 
uh, and that's how they get through week to week, just telling themselves things that are lies to make themselves feel better. Meanwhile, things get every things get worse every single year. We lose that much more. The, you know, the slippery slope remains the undefeated champion, and yet, you know, I still see it every single day. Go woke, go broke, and all these other copes that people tell themselves. Um, well, we'll get we'll we'll get into them one by one. So. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you went ahead and established kind of your bona fides there, because I, I want I was going to ask you to do that anyway. I think it's really important for people to understand that, you know, you are an academic, uh, somebody who has been a professor, like you said, you've published papers and this kind of thing. And, and you have what I think is, is very fairly described as an expert level grasp of Austrian economics. So when you come mm -hmm. at this, you're, you're not some I see some people, oh, you're a commie now, right? Like you're you're not some Marxist. You're not some radical, you know, uh, uh, leftist. You're not someone who just stumbled into this discipline um, from another one with with absolutely no background. Like you said, you, you have a, a very good grasp and have very been very firmly on that side. And I think one of the things I wanted to establish on this is th this is a big problem I had with formalism, which is like mm -hmm. uh, Mitch Mulbug's idea, right? I kept saying, why would you want things this way? And then it was. Uh, I, is one of the early NRX guys who helped me understand. He's like, he's not advocating for it. He's simply stating a fact of reality. And you sitting around and wanting your ide ideology to make it something else doesn't change the situation. I think this is a similar case with the free market. You're, you're not here advocating for, you know, central government top-down control of economics at every stage or something. You're simply noticing the the facts on the ground and saying, we, we can wish for a dream where the state is completely removed from the economic process. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, we never truly achieve that, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the the line from uh, Machiavelli is the one I would always point to. We write uh, as the world, you know, we write about the world as it is, not how it ought to be. Um, and I mean, you know, what... <laughs> When we're facing the situation we are now, um, you know, having somebody just come up with like, oh, well, in an ideal world, there wouldn't be any, you know, corporations or in an ideal world, there wouldn't be any state. It doesn't actually help. It's just like, OK, you can you can be right in your head. This is something our buddy Pete uh, Quinona says quite often. Right. It's like, well, you can be right in theory. Uh, in, in the meantime, what's actually happening here? You know, um, so, it, yeah, um, I think it's uh, if, if you're not facing reality, then you're not actually even in the right in the right game, um, especially when our opponents, uh, by which I mean the left or the radical left, if you want to put, put it that way. Um, now, you might you might think, hold on a second, uh, academic Asian. These people don't live in reality. They don't know the difference between a man and a woman, right? <laughs> um, mm. But in so much as they understand power, they do They do live in reality, yes. right? And if the left understand one thing and one thing only, it is the nature of power and how to um, achieve objectives uh, using power. Um, and, I mean, I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to say that libertarianism has been like a, like a psyop or something like that, but but I do think that that it's um it's tr it's trying to fight with like two two hands behind your back while your opponent is like bringing guns. This is the, that's how I would de describe it. You know, it's like uh, you're not even bringing a knife to the fight. They've got bazookas on the other end, and you're just kind of like literally standing there with your chin out, ready to be punched. Um, so um anyway let us uh Let's dig go, in here yeah yeah, yeah. well and, and i think it's really important you know with with the libertarian thing to say that it, as is so often the problem with so many of kind of these right-wing ideas or or you know in, in general these ideas it is the it's the maximization of the principles of problem so you might have the fact that like and we'll get deeper into this but you might have the fact that generally uh, the government not constantly interfering with price signaling and everything else that comes through the market is a good idea for your country in general. It is, it is a 
a general good guideline for how you should run it. But the maximization and, and unilateral disarmament that the right turns this into, especially libertarians, is, I think, w- what makes it more, more dangerous. But that said, let's let's go ahead and get mm-hmm. into your points here. I'm going to we're going to run through these. I'm going to present some challenges I've heard other people bring so that you can kind of mm-hmm. answer those properly and ask you some questions I have, because these these are generally along my lines. I, I'm more and less in agreement with a lot of these objections, uh, but we'll kind of guide the discussion that way. So myths yeah. of the free market. The first one here is there's never been and can never be a state of affairs that is pre-political. As such, there will always be a set of rulers who will... 10 times out of 10, intervene in the business and resources uh, of resource allocation. You got Mosca Pareto here. You could probably go ahead and stick um, Schmidt uh, or. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and a, well. point, a point I didn't make in there mm-hmm. um, regarding Schmidt in particular, it just didn't have room really to, to yeah. add it all in, right? But yeah. um, it, it, Schmidt would say that it is the exception. That is the thing of interest, right? Not the norm. Mm. Now, you can have a situation where the government does not usually get involved in certain things, but does get involved in the in the exception. OK, and everybody's mind will go to things like, I don't know, a, a famine occurs or um, I don't know. Uh, um, I mean, something like COVID-19, for example. Yeah, it's a really right? good example. Yes. <laughs> um, and. That's really where you where you can see the the system of power that is actually in place, as opposed to the one that is theoretically in place. Um, so that, that's just a little caveat I'd, I'd I'd make there. I mean, any any questions about that? Does anybody disagree with this idea that uh, the human is the political animal, and that as such, there is no outside of power. There is there is always something approximating what we call the state. I think the the issue that people might come up with here would be something to the effect of, well, there is a yes, but there is this public private distinction. Now, both of us have talked a lot about this. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I think we can both kind of we might dismiss it easily. But I think this is the objection a lot of people would come up with is, yeah, there is. But but the public and the private should be separate and the state should be bound uh, and not you know enter into the market and involve itself with this i mean my general response would be you know how how naive do you have to be to believe that a group of people who have the monopoly on violence won't in some way involve themselves in manners of economy uh but maybe you want to answer that a little more um well i mean exactly what you said aaron okay Uh, fair enough you know i mean not just economy well how about like you know putting a needle in your arm or, yeah, <laughs> you know, right. um, yes. you know, forcing, forcing your children to go to school. Yeah. I mean, nobody, basically nobody has the right to not send their kids to school. It's been mandatory for over a hundred years. <laughs> um, I mean, this is, this is one of those things that is now taken as being so normal that nobody really questions it. But once upon a time, it wasn't mandatory for kids to go to school. Uh, yeah, it's you know. <laughs> it's really interesting how often people will just normalize massive expansions of the state and still pretend like there's this free market or 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 certain constitutional restrictions are still in place, right? Like we still do this in America. We have a Tenth Amendment. It's been dead since at least the Civil War, and yet everyone still kind of is like, yeah, no, there's a there's this thing going on. Like the the, the states have these powers. Um, you know, we, we just kind of continue to play this game. And so I think it's a good, good to point out like these areas in which the government has kind of captured this power, that power is assumed to be normal and natural conservatives will of course conserve that power. In fact, during COVID, they fought very aggressively to get the kids back into government mandated, uh, uh, mm-hmm. indoctrination centers as aggressively as possible. Um, even though that is a representation of the government forcing its way into it should be a more free market type environment. Yep. All right. So yep. Number two here, the will of the stock market reflects neither the needs and wants of consumers nor the uh, allocations of resources that reflect the underlying fundamental performances of the companies uh, represented by equities. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's a, 
there's a fundamental disconnect between the the stock market and the incentives of the stock market, much of which is based on speculation, frankly, and what we might describe as the real economy. Um, and you, and you, people actually experience this in all sorts of hidden ways. Like um, I remember there was a uh, there was a much loved chain like shop in this country called Woolworths. I think there's a Woolworths in America as well, right? Um, but uh, or, or there was once. But yeah, this was like a is. shop that sold like it just sold a bit of everything, you know, like some toys, CDs, kind of pick and mix sweets, things like that. And um, suddenly one day it all closed down. Now, Woolworths had not been like selling bad, like its actual sales figures, its fundamentals were good, right? But what had happened is that um, some group of uh, investors had bought the company and just saddled it with tons and tons of debt. <laughs> and and then it defaulted on its debts and had to close down. You know, the, 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 you can see how finances caused this, like the financial world caused this store to shut. It was nothing at all to do with, um, you know, the, the uh, people like buying and selling goods, consumer goods. Um, and this is just one of many examples that you could give of the real economy and the financial economy having almost nothing to do with each other. Um, I mean, 2008, no, I think... yeah, 2008 would be another classic example, I suppose. No. no, I think a lot of people would probably come back to that and say, well, but that's an example of one aspect of a free market impacting another. That's not an aspect of the government, right? That's not an aspect. <laughs> that's not state intervention, though. I think you'll answer that more in, 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 in the, the next one here. In, in the, the very next point. Yes. Right. Yeah. So let's just move on to that one. And then we can kind of uh, tackle that whole issue together. So number three here says the public company created by the IPO is a product of law, not of free market transactions, and is therefore a function of the state. The private public distinction is lost as soon as this takes place. Yeah, and that, that's, in a, that's in a book called Nemesis by C.A. Bond. Uh, good luck good luck getting hold of that one by the way but um you actually did a stream with him it's 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 in the back catalog yeah you can find it but yeah so i mean th th this is something that's often not grasped but um as soon as as soon as a company uh floats itself and goes public you know anybody can buy shares uh you know stocks in this company now um it is it is subject to a whole lot of rules and regulations that a private company is not subject to and it's subject to uh managerial oversight as well which we'll which we'll get on to um th this is actually the uh how can i put it um you know you you, you have a book coming out Aaron, called the total state right i, mm. I, I have talked about uh, i have also talked in uh at other times about uh, something I call the octopus, which is the this kind of interconnected leviathan. But uh, I think total state gets the idea across pretty well. Um, essentially what happens when a company goes pu public is that it is more or less formally joining the, the total state under law. Um, there's also a whole set of, I mean, um, uh, regulations that dictates who it is who can who can issue those bonds. It's, it's typically done by an investment bank, you know, Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan or, or, or one of these kind of um, massive investment banks. Um, do you think, like, if you and I really wanted to get together, we could set up like a right wing investment bank? No, like, it would just... be immediately <laughs> rated. Yeah. Yeah, so you just set up your own JP Morgan, you know. Right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, maybe once upon a time that would have been possible, but I mean, it's basically, you know, there are ten of these massive ones. Um, you know, uh, in Germany, there's uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, there's UBS. I think it says uh, that's on the continent as well. Um, you know, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. I mean, there's there's just a uh, Barclays, Barcap is another one, Barclays Capital. Um, and if you have a look on the books, they've, they're basically just the same banks as they've been for like the past hundred years. I don't know when the last 
established investment bank was. But this is the mechanism through which um, companies, you know, get listed as IP as IPOs. So um, it is also the mechanism through which, for example, the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England may release uh, bonds onto the, you know, on, onto the market. That you know, that's another one of the jobs that they do. Um, you know, do you remember all that stuff about QI? Back mm -hmm, in uh, mm -hmm. quantitative it, easing, like, yeah. I mean, quantitative easing would be done, you know, via these various in, investment banks. So, the extent to which the investment bank can be uh, separated from the from the state is, you know, is tricky. Um, they are they also have a lot of robust rules. Investment banks for how they are allowed to uh, keep their own assets on their balance sheet. So there are all sorts of uh, rules, you know, MIFID II and uh, Obama passed a, a big one, I seem to recall. What was it called? Dodd, Dodd Frank or something like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what these do is they, they basically say, well, um, if you're Goldman Sachs, you have to hold a certain amount of money as uh you know this sort of asset another you know another another percentage has to be held as this sort of asset and, and they basically tell them well a certain percentage of that has to be u.s treasury bonds for example or in this country it'd be a certain percentage has to be gilt for example right so you can see how th there's actually quite a lot of constraints on what investment banks can do you know, it's I, I I say it's difficult to say how independent the investment bank is from uh, broadly what you'd call power. It's just part of the same beast. Um, so when when a company gets listed like this, they also become part of this uh, broad broad network. I would say a function of the state, um, and it, and it brings us on to the fourth point. I don't know if you want to read that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And right before we move on here with the with the fourth point, I just want to point out something something I want people to keep in mind as they're going through this is the aspect of massification, right? A lot of this um, is, and we're going to get to it because you make you kind of have several points that overlap this in, in your in your list of twelve. But the the fact that all of these organizations have grown so large and they have such a grasp of control on their markets that the only way to be competitive is to basically uh, join to yourself to the state. There is no way to generate the kind of capital, generate the kind of uh, investments necessarily, get through the regulations, comply properly, all these things, unless you are basically part and parcel uh uh, with the state. And so we're going to see this. I think this is the first uh, point that kind of makes that, but we're going to see that kind of work its way through many of yeah. these. It, it's also worth asking the question, like why would anybody become an I IPO <coughs> <coughs> if they give up all this power of control just by mm -hmm. listing themselves, right? Why would somebody like Elon Musk do it, for example? But that is the only way you're going to generate billions upon billions of dollars of capital it's that's by, necessary to break in in those markets yeah it, it is by it is by issuing stock yes you can get so far with private investments or sometimes you can get um state back grants as well um you know i know the tory party in this country are fond of uh you know uh giving backing to new firms new startups and things like that but at a certain point the only way to go to the next level to go from being a, a kind of exciting new firm to, you know, one who who's able to expand massively, is um, is by going public, and uh, an interesting example of where this actually went a little bit wrong is Twitter. Uh, mm. Speaking of Elon Musk, um, Twitter under Jack Dorsey, as I understand it, went public. I mean, they never turned a profit, which we'll get onto in a second. Yeah, and he and Dorsey basically expanded Twitter too fast, right? It, like, mm -hmm. like that's why. I mean, yes, based Elon Musk for firing all the leftists and all that, but there was actually like a real business reason to do it as well. He, Dorsey just hired way, way too many people. 
the team was extremely top heavy. There was loads of managers, right? There was loads of functions and things. And the yep. company didn't actually make any money at any point, right? Yeah, Musk fires 80% of the uh, of the staff. You know, all of Blue Check Twitter is saying their goodbyes because obviously Twitter will shut down tomorrow. It's impossible for it to operate without these people. And it's been running just fine since. So, 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 so in a strange way, Musk is one of the few cases where we've seen this happen in reverse, right? Musk has taken Twitter from being a public company back into being a private company under what we might call uh, executive entrepreneurial control. Um, but this is extremely rare. And as we'll get on to, um, Musk still has a vulnerability because his biggest company and the one that has made him the world's second richest man or he, up until a couple of weeks ago, he was the first richest man, right? Um, he has a vulnerability because that is a public company, Tesla, right? Yeah. You can buy stocks in Tesla. And as we'll, as we'll go on to, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, how are they going to get Elon Musk now? Will it be Joe Biden? Will it be the, the FBI? I actually, I actually think it'll just be the financial world. We'll be able to, they can just crash Tesla whenever they want. Scandalous, yeah. Because they, because they built, like, they also built Tesla, if that makes any sense, which we'll yeah. also get onto yeah. um, in, a, in a moment. I'm it's not dissing Tesla presence. or anything. I'm just saying that, yeah. you know, it's probably been overvalued for many, many years. Um, All right. Well, let's jump into number four because I interrupted you there to, to make that point. So we'll, we'll keep it moving here. So number four is very interesting because uh, I've heard a couple of different people push back about, about this one. So we'll probably spend a little bit of time with it. Mass shareholders lose functional control over companies uh, to the managerial class, according to the Iron Law of Oligarchy, organization is oligarchy, Mikels, uh, who no longer run, uh, who no longer who no longer run it for profit, but rather for the expansion of managerial power. Now, this is something that both you and I have talked about. This is a key aspect of James Burnham's work, and it's uh, it's it's a big issue as to you know this is this is part of the. Um, the third uh, law of, uh, of Robert Conquest's uh, laws of politics. And so this is something that's really central to a lot of things we've talked about. But the people who I've heard challenge this idea, the managers wrest control of the company away. Mm -hmm. I've heard people like Tho Bishop come up against this. I've also heard uh, actually uh, Moldbug himself, you know, Curtis Yarvin mm -hmm. said that actually Burnham's worst book is The Manager of Revolution. And he doesn't believe that the managers ever wrest control away from the CEO. So what would you say to people who say this is bad analysis, the CEO or the owners at the end of the day always well, actually control the company? Well, 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 the first thing I'd say is that the CEO in many cases is a manager. Right, right. Right. We're talking about the difference between um, um, Elon Actual Musk, ownership. say, as, as 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 the Twitter boss, right? Who is a mm -hmm. who is the CEO of Twitter, but he's also effectively the executive, right? He is the mm -hmm. hundred percent owner of the company. Um, another example would be, I don't know, like back when he was alive, Henry Ford or Vince McMahon. For many many years, was the man, right, who ran uh, WWE wrestling. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, versus somebody like Eric Schmidt, who is the CEO of uh, of Google, or uh, Tim Cook, right at Apple, who is a hired manager. He has the title CEO, but he's still a manager. Um, and th 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 that's the real difference. It is it is whether the person is essentially a glo essentially a kind of monarch within the company who owns it outright and has the final say on things uh, and see who and the CEO who himself could be hired and fired um and i mean when a when a company becomes a uh, uh, public in this way um they have to by law appoint uh, a board of governors who are responsible for reviewing the executive board. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but you're familiar with this process, right? There's a mm -hmm. there's a there's a board of governors who are typically people from other companies or professionals, out, you know, who don't actually work for 
you know, whatever the company is, and um, they uh, have oversight. They can review the pay, they can make recommendations, and if the CEO is really kind of out of line or whatever, they can even make a they can even make a recommendation for the CEO to be replaced. Um, they have to be voted on by shareholders. Okay, uh, mm. the, 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 that board of governors. Um, now, now in practice. I'm just trying to think of the sorts of points uh, our buddy Tho Bishop might make. Yeah. And I, I remember I, I, w I worked on a report once on uh, Peter Thiel's company, which is called um, Palantir. You familiar with that? It's, a, yes. it's, it's actually responsible for a scary amount of like US security and cybersecurity <laughs> and stuff like that. I mean, Peter Thiel is just an incredibly powerful guy. Um, but like, for example, Peter Thiel is clever and he's made it so he's effectively irreplaceable in that company. Mm. Like if you, like he's got, um, like he, he's made it so that his votes, for example, are magic. He can, like it, if, uh, if it was put to the vote, oh, let's get rid of Peter Thiel, he could just kind of veto it with his like mag magic votes. Um, and there's a, there's certain other things like within his, Within his within the terms and conditions, it's like oh, you can't actually like replace the CEO and things like that. Um, and there's all sorts of other weird things like his technical pay is zero and things like that. So so there are there are ways and means that I mean, Molberg may have stuff like that in mind, given that he's kind of in with that set, right? He's probably seen right. he's probably talked to Peter Thiel and he's like, and Peter Thiel's like, yeah, well that's bollocks because look at the what I've done type thing, but. Yeah. That's it, not how the average company is constructed, right? I mean, it, in a way, Peter Thiel is still quite close to his own company, right? This mm -hmm. would be like if Walt Disney or Henry Ford was still alive. The question is, well, what happens to that company ten years after Peter Thiel's dead, right? Can like, can you, you know, let's take Henry Ford as an example, right? What happened to Henry Ford and the Ford Foundation and the Ford Motor Company? Yeah. <laughs> Did it stay true to the values of Henry Ford? Probably <laughs> not. No. No, no, it didn't. I mean, you know, Henry Ford was conservative. The Ford Foundation are the biggest, or one of the biggest uh, founder um, funders of LGBT activism and left wing activism in the country, and have been since the nineteen sixties. Um, as as an example, I'm just showing how ownership and control aren't the same thing. Right. And as soon as you allow the managers in. It's only a matter of time until control is wrested away from the original owner. Um, I mean, we mentioned Vince McMahon. It's even happened to Vince McMahon. Even as somebody as a control, um, you know, a control freak like Vince has still managed to lose control of his own company within his life within his lifetime. You know, they got him through a sex scandal, and because the WWE is a public company now, they have all sorts of oversight that. You know, he just can't get away with it like he used to when it when it was his when it was just his. Mm. Um, so now somebody else is running things uh, there, um, and I mean, you know, let, let's just say, do, do you think it's going to stay true to his values, or is it going to get more woke? Is it going to get more politically correct? Is it going to come in line with the rest of the culture? Yeah, it's going to um, re return to room temperature as soon as it's the hand of a decisive inv individual is off the leadership of the company. Right. Um, and in, in in fact, if, if people read The Populist Illusion, I actually give many cases of the actual founder owner of a company being fired. I mean, the, the, the famous one was Papa, pa Papa John's Pizza, right? right he was right. fired from his own company. And, and he's <laughs> the face of the company. He's not like some <laughs> random guy who operated the company that no one knew. It's it's named after he's he's on all of the commercials. Like he's the guy on the side of the box. Like he's the guy in the way that Colonel Sanders, you know, was Kentucky Fried Chicken and he got fired. Yeah. So so yeah. there are there are lots of examples like that. I mean, you know, yeah. the, um, you can pick your own ones because there's there's literally hundreds to choose from. So so I, I would I would I would say yes, there are loopholes that somebody cl really clever like Peter Thiel would know how to leverage. Like one of the really funny things about uh, that report I did is that um, under California law, you have to have a woman as one of your board members. Hmm. 
Peter Thiel just like has some random journalist on there who wrote a book about him. Like, <laughs> I, was, like, I was hoping like you were going to say that he changed his gender identity to meet the standards, but yeah, no, that's that's the other. <laughs> no, good I, I mean, it, what I'm saying is he's he got like yeah. he's just got like a lackey who has no business acumen, no business history, no like. I mean, usually if you're a if you sit on the board of governors, you have to have like a 20 year career as a C level executive or something like that. But he's just like stuck flunkies on there. Just um, make it the most affirmative action hire possible. Don't even, you know, oh, I mean, give it's, it the it's, pretense. It, if people want to laugh, they should go to the Palantir website and have a look at their uh, board of governors. Um, but, 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 but anyway, um, right. it, yes. Um, so, yeah, there could be a couple of exceptional individuals like that. But I would say that he is much more the exception rather than the rule. Right. You know, and I'd say like 90% plus, especially like household name companies, the ones, you know, um, uh, Coca-Cola or something. I mean, these are so far removed from the original visionaries who set them up that they were long, long ago captured by by the managers. And I mean, the evidence that this is true is in all of the bloat that you see in those companies, right? I mean, does anybody really think that Coca-Cola needs like a massive um, diversity and equality division? Like that, that drives the bottom line. That's for profit. Um, I mean, it's not, I mean, you can see with a lot of the decisions they make, it's not for profit. Um, although that there is a, there is a bottom line uh, when it comes to diversity there is a, a financial reason to do it because, of course, they get sued um, by some, mm. anybody in America who claims discrimination. That's an automatic lawsuit. Um, I mean, the, the, I think the famous case was uh, when uh, do, do you remember when they, those two homeless guys were like sitting in Starbucks? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, that was a lawsuit. Got, Starbucks. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so, so there, there, there is a money factor there, but. It's not, it's not only that, right? There are, you have to look at the incentive of the manager on the ground. Um, and I think anybody who's ever worked in a big company, I'm talking like a kind of, you know, blue chip company, I guess you'd call it, would, would know of entire departments and divisions that exist for their own expansion, not for the bottom line profit. Right. Well, and and I think it was Mike of Imperium Press who did the the video making a really interesting point about um, diversity inclusion departments as regulatory capture, right? Like most people are familiar with the concept of regulatory capture. I think the idea that that big companies actually want a number of regulations because small companies can't keep pace. And that means that they can't actually like be upstart competitors and the big companies have a massive advantage. So they're fine with the government regulation because they can comply. And that's also true of diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you have to have X number of people of different races or you know gender ideology or whatever on your board or, or in positions of power in your company, and there are only, only so many people actually capable of you know, uh, doing that job in those specific demographics, then being the large company that can hoover up those people and staff those positions creates a form of regulatory capture for your company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 there's a guy in the chat saying the FCC will not issue a license unless 33% of your employees are minorities. So there you go. Okay. You know. Well, let's go ahead and uh, pivot to five here because this dovetails with four. To compound this, limited liability laws remove accountability ability or material feedback for managers and employees of every large form. I mean, feel like this one's pretty straightforward, but you know, if you're a manager, you're not going to go bankrupt because the company did something wrong, right? Yeah, and, and even more importantly, you may not even go to jail. Mm -hmm. Even if you, I mean, I think there's probably some sort of threshold for, for uh, criminal negligence, uh, criminal negligence or something like that. But um, I think that threshold's pretty high. Like you have to, the company will take the rap in the abstract, right? Well, who's the company? The company's nobody. <laughs> yes. All right. So people do, I mean, quite literally get away with murder in many cases uh, under this uh, limited liability uh, law, which is also, by the way, a legal a legal fiction. If you want to, right. you know, it's a function of the state yet again. So, number six here. Uh, in addition, massive asset management firms like BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street uh, are now so large that they can dictate the market for any given share through the effective control of institutional investors across every sector 
and indirect control through the waves and ripples any movement they make will create for the rest of the market. Yeah, I mean, BlackRock um, and Vanguard and State Street, if you ever want to have some fun, right, click on any company you can think of and have a look who their largest who their largest shareholders are. And pretty much any company, and I'm talking about the big blue chip brand name ones now, right? The S&P 500 type firms will be three to 4% owned by BlackRock, Vanguard, and or State Street. Um, also, BlackRock are the largest shareholders on st of, state, of State Street as well. Right, they all own each other, right? <laughs> they all own each other as well. Yeah. Right, uh, and then... Um, and then you can have a look. Well, I don't know, like, let's say Coca Cola as an example, which are three to four percent owned by each one of these. You can then have a look at Coca Cola's own kind of investment wing, because there's like a you know Coca Cola Investments, because they have to invest their money, and they will also be like a one or two percent. So they all kind of every company owns each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you can imagine. A firm that powerful, like BlackRock or Vanguard, starts to move on a on a stock or something like that. That will send just. A, I mean, we talked about market signals, right? Just that movement alone will create a ripple effect for all the other firms to to act. And in many cases, it won't even be a human being doing it. It's all just an algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, I mean, speaking of algorithms, there's also this thing called Aladdin which is um, a kind of um, investment platform software thing mm -hmm. that uh, BlackRock made its name selling. Um, and Aladdin, as I understand it, isn't a kind of neutral platform. Like it kind of makes little helpful suggestions. You know, have you considered investing in Tesla? gives you good ESG points or whatever it is, you know. So it's not a neutral. It kind of gives you little nudges. Um, so if you can imagine, that also creates its waves and ripples, right? If um, Aladdin AI today is telling you, well, this is a good one to go for, can you imagine how many firms all at once go for the same thing? Um, that, that, now, I'm, I'm not saying that there are – obviously – the financial world is huge and there are many players in it little ones big ones there are market making firms um i'm just saying that these firms are big enough that they set a tempo right and l let's say if the managers at blackrock really had it in for a certain company okay let's just pretend to take uh, an example that our friend curtis yarvin sometimes likes to make like Let's imagine that um, pick a huge company. Let's think of a huge company. Uh, I Nabisco. Don't know. Huh? Nabisco. What, yeah. Let's say. That, let's just say that they came out as Nazis. <laughs> like, right? We are a Nazi firm now. <laughs> the tree elves. I knew it the whole time. <laughs> right. We are. We are now the Nazi firm. We stand for. Uh, we, we stand for the mid-century German. <laughs> um. I mean, how do you think BlackRock would respond to that? Let the market decide, of, right? It'd be fine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. let the market decide, but yeah. no, I think you'd, <laughs> you'd quickly see a movement yeah. on the, those shares and you'd see a massive crash in the share price of whatever firm that happened to be. Um, regardless of how many trainers they're selling or whatever it is they sell, right? Um, you know, it would be the Kanye Westization, if you want, of that company. Um, right. just at just at that kind of level. Um, so, I mean, okay, I'm making an extreme point just to illustrate the fact that, you know, it, there is power held in these firms. Um, one of the things I would recommend people doing is to make a habit of, re of reading Larry Fink's letter to the CEOs. He writes one every quarter, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's called something like Larry Fink's letter to the CEOs. And in that letter, Larry Fink basically lays out his vision for the next like year or whatever. And it's not like a neutral letter. It's not like, I mean, remember, this guy is meant to be just an asset manager looking after your wealth, you know, 
making money for people who have pensions and things like that. But it's not that. It's like, oh, we have a duty to make the world a better place. Um, you know, uh, we, we must get to net uh, net zero carbon by this year. And, uh, you know, all of those all of those great World Economic Forum talking points go directly in Larry Fink's letter. And in it, there's an implicit threat. Uh, I mean, they'll always catch it in a certain way. You'll say things like, you know, it's incumbent on us to be leaders in the pub public-private partnership. We can either be ahead of the game or behind the game, and you want to be ahead of the game. That's how he'll that's how he'll phrase it. But yeah. the implicit threat is, listen, buddy, if you're not on board, either one, it, you know, if you're a, a hired CEO, you'll be fired or whatever, or two, um, you know, if you don't get on board, we're going to ensure that you're no longer in the top 10 or top top 100 or whatever it is. Um, and I think we're actually seeing a little bit of that now with Tesla. Tesla's, uh, I mean, since I've been following Elon Musk, I cannot help but notice that every day Tesla's price is going down and he's moaning about, like, he's like, what's going on, guys? I'm still selling loads of electric cars. Um, and it's like, well, what happened? What happened for Tesla's price to come down now? Um, hmm. Well, so, this uh, this works well into number seven here, because speaking of those incentives and, and the need to get in line, uh, I think a lot more people are familiar with this now than they were just a few years ago. But you have uh, through these mechanisms and even attempts to formalize them like ESG, managers can inflate stocks for bogus companies who create zero real value. I uh, think the green uh, the green sector, 87% of Silicon Valley firms never see a profit, yet their share prices have been greatly inflated over a decade. It's driven by ideology, not what the customers want. So these companies like Tesla might be on the upswing when they're you know conforming with ESG and they've got the buzz around, the, the, you know, they're in the right ideological quadrant uh, of politics and everything. Uh, and so they can get hyped up, they can get expanded to even companies that don't actually produce anything valuable, uh, can, can get this, uh, this hype and this inflation, uh, but then they can artificially be reduced if they're no longer kind of on board with the ideology. Yeah. And the, um, the weird, the weird thing about this is that if you ever see how these kind of equities valuations are done, you know, I mean, we're talking like really, really complex sums and spreadsheets and things. But effectively, they're all based on like 10 and 15 year projections. So it's like this company that's been around since 2008. In the year 2035, they'll probably start making a lot of money. So you want to get in on that hour on. You want to, if you want to make a real return, you need to get, you need to get in quick on whatever that company happens to be. Right. And there, I mean, it, one of the other interesting things you could do, you can have a look at, um, I think it's Forbes or, fortune is it? it's one of those but they, they release a, a rich list every year right of mm -hmm. like the leading billionaires go through that and pick and look up the ones who's who are in like software or you know companies you've never heard of like just have a look like who are they where they come from how much money do they make every year and you'll you'll come across loads of people who are multi multi billionaires who've never whose companies have never actually made a dime, not even like one penny in the past decade. Uh, I mean, it's, it, to me, this is an insane situation. Um, and yet this has been the economy. And this is the, the entire California economy is, is, is built on this kind of, right. I mean, you'd call it, uh, historically, you'd call it a bubble, wouldn't you? But it never seems to burst. It just keeps, it's been, just keeps on getting bigger. Since that internet crash of, 2001 or whatever they just keep on getting bigger and bigger these companies yeah back when pet.com ruled the earth um but <laughs> let's see here number eight uh, on top of this managers in government see the fed and central banks can work with managers in finance see blackrock and vanguard to topple any rogue ceo see current tesla stock prices or even any rogue government uh, see Bank of England plus market versus Liz Trust. So we've already talked about this a little bit, but yeah, the the uh, finance and government managers can coordinate to tech out anyone who isn't properly playing the game, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and and in in the case of Liz Truss, who after all only really wanted to reduce tax by one pence, right? 
I mean, she was the prime minister, <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, there, there are a few there are a few other uh, part pieces to that uh, jigsaw, but you know, oh, the sky was falling in. But the the reason that happened is because remember those market signals. The Bank of England made a statement counter signaling the Chancellor of the Exchequer, created a run on gilt, and you know, the market is going to respond. Like, if the Bank of England makes a statement, the market will respond, right? Or if Larry Fink makes a statement, the market will respond. Or if um, the chairman of the Fed makes a statement, the market will respond. So you can see that the, you can see that there are these um, pieces of the machine, or the pieces of the total state, if you want, that can, in a strange way, remove um other pieces that aren't playing exactly the ball they want you know mm. and we're talking about Liz Tr Liz Trust was not like kind of some kind of uh this wasn't like appointing Anne Rand as prime minister or something <laughs> yeah. like that right this is just kind of like a you know a you know, slightly thick bog standard Tory uh you know Tory but for whatever reason the system wanted Rishi Sunak in power it didn't want Liz Trust in power and so, you know, what happened happened. Um, so uh, yeah, and and currently we're seeing Tesla stock price, which has, I mean, Tesla is a really interesting example because I think, uh, and forgive me if there are any Tesla stands in the audience or whatever, I I think that nobody really wants electronic cars, Aaron. Right? This is just like a, this is like a kind of bullshit product. To to be to be frank. Um, it doesn't solve the issue. It's energy inefficient, right? You, you can make them as cool as you want. You can put video games in a Tesla for all anybody cares, but it's still it's still not really something that people pe people in their heart of heart wants. It is it, it's being driven by a, by an agenda, a green agenda, and I think this partly accounts for Elon Musk's enormous wealth because the stock price of Tesla has been artificially push through the roof because this has to be the next best thing. Why does it have to be the next ne the, the next big thing? Because everybody says so, because we have to reach net zero carbon or whatever. So in a strange way, Musk has ridden that grift for many years. Now he's become enemy rather than friend. All of a sudden, oh, surprise, surprise, they don't really care about electric cars that much. I think Joe Biden even said, like, oh, I really care about the environment, but not enough to drive a Tesla. <laughs> Did you see you said that? Well, Why well, I imagine that? <laughs> well, well, I think what's really interesting about the Tesla market is it feels like it's almost, and this is just anecdotal, I don't have any data or anything on this, but it feels like it's driven almost entirely by upper middle class climbers. Like it's been sold as a status symbol to people who want to signal that they're on the ascent and they're like with the ruling ideology. And that is almost its entire market. Like the really rich don't want Teslas and like guys who need to haul heavy stuff across town don't want Teslas. But people who really want Teslas are like, you know, they're managers. It's, it's managers. It is. It's, it's, it is. <laughs> it, it's exactly who it is. It's, it's those who who kind of want to show that they're on the ascent that the show signal that they're with the game plan, but there's only so many of those people. It's, it, it can't be an average everyday car. I mean, that's why the meme where everyone was like, well, the, you know, the, you know, like Pete Buttigieg being like, well, isn't it great that the price of gas will go up? Cause then everyone will have to buy a Tesla. It's like, well, not everybody makes 50 grand Pete. So, or, or not everyone makes enough to buy a 50 grand car this year, Pete. So actually like the vast majority of people are just taking a big L on your higher gas prices. <laughs> And so I think that's uh, I think that's the thing is there's only so much of a market for this. The, the really rich don't want it. The poor can't afford it. The lower middle class are either repulsed by it or it doesn't do the job they need. It's really only one very specific section of the population that sees it as the status symbol. Yeah, and I think Elon Musk is gonna is gonna discover pretty quickly. He's gonna do, he, Elon Musk is speed running Carl Schmidt. I don't know if you noticed this, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Friend enemy doesn't work where, oh, we get to be friends on this issue over here, but on this issue over here, we're going to enemies. It doesn't work like that. So yeah, He's getting I the IDW crash course where it's like, oh, I, yeah, I thought I agree with you on 90% of things. How, why am I suddenly 
the second coming of the mid century Germans. Oh, because a disagreeing with one thing puts me on the enemy list and that's all that matters. But I, I, I am convinced that this will extend also to Tesla in yeah. time. Uh, and we're watching, we're actually watching it happen now. Um, and I would be surprised at what I suspect will happen. I don't want it to happen, but what I suspect will happen is that Tesla will be the mechanism through which the total state disciplines Musk. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, Musk is interesting, though, because like Thiel, he's quite in with what people call the deep state, like the security apparatus and things like that through um, mm -hmm. SpaceX. So, th so th those two, those two guys in particular, have done an interesting job of kind of making themselves curiously indispensable to the to like the deep state. So he has some leverage, the other way, right? But I still think they'll try to discipline him through through Tesla. Um, yeah, well, Starlink is another aspect of this, right? They needed uh, internet in Ukraine, so they had they you know needed Musk to to deploy Starlink there. So yeah, I think there are interesting. Interesting, you know, a lot of people will get on to Musk and understandably so for kind of being in bed with the state. But there is the other, there's the flip of that where, as you're pointing out, it could be a, a strategy of, you know, making yourself in indispensable so that there's less pressure the state can immediately put on you without endangering its own operations. Yeah, although if push comes to shove, I don't know why they just wouldn't say, yeah, we're going to nationalize it. We're going right. to <laughs> or yeah, something similar. All something right, so number that. nine, uh, the iron law of oligarchy extends also to the consumer level. It's not it's not the consumers who are sovereign, but the purchasing uh, managers of a supermarket who dictate which goods uh, they see on the sh shelves and which shelves and which one they don't. Even if there are massive market demand for, say, Alex Jones, the Apple supermarket is not going to allow it on their shelves, but it's the same with any consumer good. Yeah, so this is really important, right? The people who actually get to curate the marketplace, and especially, again, as these marketplaces centralize, as everyone gets used to getting their podcast through Apple and everyone gets used to watching their video on YouTube in not willing to go somewhere else, these uh, these platforms get who get to curate who's on there and who's not have a massive amount of control. So even if you think you have a uh, free market, uh, you might end up getting a lot more uh, Lex Friedman commercials on your YouTube than you will <laughs> Alex Jones, right? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Well, Alex Jones will be banned for one. And, right, right, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, whoever the you know whoever the purchasing manager is decides well. We're going to push Friedman now, but mm. it's—I mean—it's not just that. It's like brands of sausages or you know soft drinks or whatever it happens to be. What the what the consumer actually sees is curated. Uh, one one of the best um, places you can see this is is in if you ever go through a supermarket, have a look at the books on the shelf that's being sold in the supermarket. Right, I mean, are they the books that everybody wants? in theory but in practice i mean you're not going to see my book there you, 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 <laughs> oh come you're, on <laughs> you're going to see can't think of the populist delusion as i walk through my my local uh I, I, grocery I, store I, I i i don't think so um a true crime but you are gonna you are gonna see various other books which have a ideological bent let's just say a lot more eat uh, pray love than machiavellian politics yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, no, they'll, they'll, they, they, they will be uh, books for the thinking man, but it'll be like, um, you know, Homo sapiens by Yuval Harari. You know, this is this would be the sort of thing that uh, that you'll see in the in the airport. You know, um, yeah. so yes. All right. So uh, number. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go further there? Or? Yeah. The, 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 this also works the other the um the other way so we've talked about like alex jones being banned or certain products not being allowed on the shelf mm -hmm. do you remember the massive massive push about a year ago to get beyond meat products sold <laughs> yes everywhere? i like, love your point about this. this is very good please go in depth a little bit on this because I, I love your your spiel on this uh, well i mean some <laughs> i mean let's face it there there would be some purchasing manager probably a fat woman okay um who is in charge of procurement for a supermarket what new products get on the shelves okay she will be given a kpi that is um you know her boss her manager will tell her 
listen, you have now written into your contract, we have to be uh, net carbon uh, zero compliant by this time. And your KPI is dependent on us reaching this target. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, also, by the way, we've set you up with a meeting with Beyond Meat, who tick all these boxes. Uh, like if you're that procurement manager, regardless of how many people actually want Beyond Meat, are you going to give it a place on the shelf? And the fact of the matter is, is that every single supermarket went big on Beyond Meat. Not only that, McDonald's, uh, Burger King, they all went big on Beyond Meat plant-based burgers. And they put it as number one on their menu. I don't know if that's still the case, but at, at one point, if you went to McDonald's and you went on the electronic menu that's replaced real workers, it was the first one. It'd be like, have a plant, have a muck plant. Or you could have a Big Mac or all the other things, but it put it as number one. So that's a little nudge technique there. And what was incredible is that during the pandemic, when food was running out and people, you remember where people were panic buying and things like that? Yes. Um, <laughs> even during all of that, nobody touched the Beyond Meat burgers. There were empty shelves, no fruit, no veg, no, no, but nobody would touch it. Even at reduced price, nobody would touch the, the Beyond Meat stuff. And um, that is actually one area where the total state seems to have taken an L. Because if you look at the Beyond Meat stock price now, it is crashing and burning. And even Bill Gates came out and said, look, guys, this hasn't worked. People just don't want to do this. So we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. And if Bill Gates is saying that, that's, you're pretty much screwed. So, um, so yeah, I, I, li yeah. I live in Florida. And of course, we get hurricanes pretty regularly. And one of the amazing things is like even when the hurricanes are coming through and like all of the shelves are completely uh, empty because everyone's buying food for the next few weeks because who knows if they're going to have power or, or anything like this. There's always one thing left on the shelf every time. There's one thing that no one, no matter how desperate they are, never, never buys. And it is the Beyond Meat stuff. So, yeah. But, I, I but, think but that... just, just, just think about that, though. Did it stop them buying it? Did it stop like... We saw Beyond Meat fail in every single shop. It didn't stop every single fast food chain going big on it. it it's still stop. on the menu. For, and for it's like still Burger there, King right? It's still, yeah. it's they're still, still buying the stuff and throwing it away. You know they're just buying it and throwing cartons of it away. There are also new businesses opening. Yeah. Plant-based, like, fast food chain. We own, like, a vegan fast food chain, you know. Um, there's one called Leon in this country that's gone, like, oh, we're plant only now. I mean, I don't know who goes there. I don't know if they get like government money on the side or something to do this, do this. But um, yeah, um, the, the Beyond Meat thing in this country, I know, was actually I found a white paper um, written and recommended to the government in 2019, where they basically laid out the entire plan of what they were going to do. I mean, freely available information. The government want this. Yeah. Right. So you've got the government... Uh, basically pushing out an edict and all of the other parts of the total state, you know, enacting that. I mean, it's basically the Soviet Union, Aaron. <laughs> this is what used to happen in the Soviet Union. They used to have like, you know, <laughs> they used to have like shells full of stuff nobody wanted. And then at the same time, there'd be a shortage of razor blades. Of all the <laughs> things people actually need. Yeah. Well, let's, I want to get into the implications, but let's go ahead and finish these last three here real quick. Uh, so we have plenty of time to, to kind of get into the implications of what all this means. So number 10, consumers are effectively trained as cattle into long-term purchasing habits that are nearly perfectly predictable by companies who produce those goods. Most markets have a market leader with a 70% share like Coke, a number two brand with 29% share like Pepsi, and the rest of the market who make up the other 1%. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I've had this... Um... There's this website called Statistica. I don't know if you, you've ever come across no, that. No, um, no. Uh, well, if you want to pull up stats on anything, you have to subscribe. You have to give money. But um, uh, you can just lo lose hours. You can have hours of fun. Thinking, think of any industry you want, any product you want, butter, say, or fairy, you know, w w washing up liquid or, I don't know, 
um, cheese-based maize snacks, whatever it happens to be. And you will find this pattern where there's a there's a market leader, there's a number two brand, and then there's the rest of the market, which in many cases is the supermarket's own when it comes to consumer goods. It'd be like um, in this country, it's Tesco's and Sainsbury's. I guess there it'd be like, what are your supermarket like Walmart? Mm-hmm. What are your big supermarkets called? Yeah, like Walmart, Walgreens, uh, you know, Albertsons, like all the different ones we have here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, one of the things I found is that there are companies who are specialists in being the number two brand. So, so PepsiCo as a company are very r- rarely the market leader in any good, right? But they're very often the number two brand. And... Uh, I mean, everybody thinks like Coke and Pepsi arrive, but you'd think it was 50-50, right, that market. But it's not. Coke are very much the market leader. Pepsi are the number two. But then, like, I don't know, go over into another market, and, like, you'll find, like, Doritos are the number two, like, maize-based snack or something, which are owned by PepsiCo. And they're like that, like, across the board. Any any product they run, they're the number two. Another company I found like that were Unilever, right? Uh, which is a big European company. You know, like in our in our supermarkets, they're the number two brand across basically every cosmetic you can imagine. Um, so, yeah, being number two is a pretty good position, right? So there's there's plenty of people who are are willing to slide into. You need to you need to like coin this term. You know, like the Parvini distribution or something, so that you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I call it. I call it. There's that. always a, there's always a Coke and there's always a Pepsi. I mean, it's yeah, you need something right? snappier. You gotta you gotta put your you gotta put <laughs> but, your stamp on it here. But, but you see, what's interesting is that the illusion of choice that you get on the shelf is very often just a choice. Like your choice really is. Number one brand, number two brand, and then um, supermarket zone. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't know what it's like in America, but in this country, there are many, many brands that are secretly owned by the number one brand or the two brand. Right. Yeah. This is your we, number 11 here, right? Like, well, you, no, no, it's, it's you know? actually, um, I don't know what they call it, like a legacy brand name or whatever. I, I'll mm. give you an example, right? In this country, the Coke of the chocolate market is Cadbury's. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it is in America. You have weird chocolate over there. It's Hershey's. more like Hershey's, yeah. Yeah, but in this country, it's Cadbury's. It's quite bad. Cadbury's yeah. chocolate. Yeah. Cadbury's, by the way, isn't really Cadbury's. It's owned by, I think it was bought by Kraft at the one point, which is sick and evil and wrong, but let's not get into <laughs> it. Anyway, it's Cadbury's. But then there are all like these chocolate bars from the 1920s, like fries turkish delight say or i don't know like uh macintosh chocolates or you know whatever whatever it happens to be all of those old legacy brands are also owned by cadbury's and the ones that aren't owned by cadbury's are owned by nestle and the ones that aren't owned by nestle are owned by mars whatever it is so you never really get away from these companies because all of the like if you're just uh, if you don't really look at the packaging you you'd assume they were separate companies, right? But in actual fact, it's all just like two companies. Which so you, yeah. And then if you dig into the BlackRock and the Vanguard stuff, be like, hold up, the same people own these two companies anyway. So what's the difference between Coke and Pepsi? They're so all just this, managers, you know? <laughs> there's this weird uh, phenomenon in America. I don't know if it, if it happens in, in, uh, in the UK, but be, due to our like value buying sh- uh, habits or whatever, this is a little more apparent in America because like you go to the uh, to the soda aisle, right? You go to the soft drink aisle, and there's you know sixty different options. Uh, and what happens is every week, like it's the what one is on sale. It's buy two of, of this kind of product, get one free. And and so if, if it's buy two Coke products, get one free, then half the sodas basically are included in that. And then the next week it's well, buy you know two Pepsi products, get one free. And it's the other half. So actually, even though you've got 40 different sodas all there, you it kind of reveals itself that actually all of those 40 sodas are produced by either one or two companies, and it doesn't matter which one you're grabbing of the 40 different ones, you're actually only ever getting one of the two uh, leaders there. Yeah. But let's just, go to... It doesn't oh, matter. Sorry. The free market are on. Just make your own Coca-Cola. Yeah, right. <laughs> just, just go ahead and break in. 
Uh, so number 11, even if consumers were not cattle, but perfectly rational actors, most of the leading firms are now so big that it's impossible to boycott. Uh, Procter and Gamble is the best recent example following the Gillette ad, which lost them $8 billion. The CEO was not even fired. And he said, I do it again. Procter and Gamble can eat that up. So yeah, you already mentioned that a little bit, but, but this is why go woke, go broke is such, is such a joke because even if the company you think you're trying to punish is uh, done something you don't like, you're actually probably just going to end up switching to one of their other products in an attempt to punish them and not even realize it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I realized this when I tried to actually boycott Procter and Gamble, right. Mm -hmm. Myself after the Gillette ad, um, you know, as you know, three years ago, I uh, had a baby daughter um, and try just try boycotting Procter and Gamble when it's 2 a.m. You've run out of nappies. I guess you guys would say diapers, right? Mm -hmm. You have to do like a 2 a.m. run to the 24 hour store uh, to pick up, uh, I don't know, like wet wipes and nappies. Oh, Pampers are owned by Procter and Gamble. Shit. This, this store doesn't have an alternative to Pampers at this time of night. I've got no other option. What can I do? Oh, here's an alternative. Oh, they're owned by Procter and Gamble as well. All oh, right. So the, the number two brand in this in this field is also Procter and Gamble. Um, what about this cream? Oh, that's a, that's owned by Procter and Gamble. What what about this other baby product? Oh, that's owned by Procter and Gamble. And then th let's just pretend that you you can manage to find an alternative. Well, the alternative in all of those fields will be uh, owned by Unilever instead. Well, do you think Unilever is like for toxic masculinity? Or like, do you think Unilever doesn't do like uh, woke advertising? Or do you think Unilever is going to like come out uh, as being like on our side of the culture wars? I mean, it's probably no owned by a good percentage by the same people who own Procter & Gamble in the first place, like BlackRock and such. Right. So, so there is no like go woke, go broke. Like, What, what are you talking about? Who you who are you gonna buy those products for instead? You know, mm. are we gonna go like? I mean, okay, we could go Nate. Like maybe I can uh, wrap my baby in a in a towel like they do in the eighties or something. I don't know. Like there's one, but it, it, most people aren't gonna do that. Yeah. So now I'm just kind of like making my life more difficult for some principle. But it's like, well, if it's this difficult for me to do it, I know that guy over there who said he's gonna do it is not gonna. You know, I'm autistic, Aaron. I'm gonna, I'm gonna really, really try hard, but I couldn't do it. And if I can't do it, none of these people watching the show are gonna do it either. So, well, and <laughs> and a lot of people who think they're escaping this by going to some brand outside of the mainstream, like, oh, I'm gonna order this specialty online, or I'm gonna go to this specific, you know, artisanal whatever. It turns out that if those people, because of the economy and scale, actually want to be able to distribute those products to you they're probably just buying materials from all the companies you're trying to boycott and functionally repackaging them and selling them back to you as some kind of independent actor. You, you, you get, you get into all sorts of like really quite black pilling areas. Like, uh, you know, I buy a lot of books. I buy a lot of secondhand books as everybody knows. And, um, everybody will say, Oh yeah, don't use Amazon. They're evil. Use, use aid books. Until you find out that A Books is owned and operated by Amazon, right. <laughs> of course. it's just like there's just no way out of this. You know, they own, like they they own everything. Um, you know, apart from the couple of little companies that we run, they don't own the academic agency. But even even in a strange way, they do because oh come on, um, you, we know you're a subsidiary. Like let's let's be honest. Well, I mean, well, I run it through Thinkific, and uh, on the back end, there'll be uh, you know some some processing company mm. ultimately you'll get into um the payment processing it'll be visa or mastercard so if the state really really wanted to go after me and shut me down they just like shut my bank account or they just be like you well we're gonna turn off payment processing from your site so th th there is there is no off the grid i mean let's yeah. just face it there there is no way there's no way to um uh get outside of what we're calling the total state when it comes to engagement with the economy. Um, you know, even these theoretical bits of free market that we're thinking about aren't really truly independent. It's a network. It's a grid. It's a, it's a matrix, uh, if you want to use that. And there's no outside of it. There's no, 
you, you, they've made it. Uh, I remember our friend Charlemagne made a very good video once called No Exit, right? Yes. And they've made it so there is truly no exit, you know, and, and unless you want to go back to barter economy or something, living in a hut, <laughs> um, you know, you're, 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 you're pretty much stuck with this. You, you, you can't boycott them. Um, you can you can give them a bloody no. I mean, eight billion dollars is not like Trump change, right? Yeah. But they can they can take it. They can take it because they know that even if people really successfully boycott their razor blades, they have got literally three hundred other products that you you can't live without. So what are you going to do now? <laughs> right. <laughs> You'll own nothing and be happy, Aaron. <laughs> Well, so uh, I think I think number twelve here we we've basically covered kind of with everything else we've talked about. So I want to go ahead and because we I know you've got a, a show coming up uh, next yeah. hour on popular opinions for anyone who's unfamiliar should definitely go check that out as soon as we're done here. But I want us to have time to be able to talk about the implications and then get through any super chats we had. So okay, so now we understand the market is not free. It's very difficult to create the kind of free market that I think a lot of people assumed was operating back when they were a kid, but now we know that that was kind of an illusion and we were kind of always under this capture uh, of the state economically. So what are the implications here? I think a lot of people's immediate response are like the one, some of the ones I saw in, their, in things like, okay, so everyone just becomes a communist now. Like if the free market is a myth, then what do we do with this information other than understand that it's like a practical, it's a practical truth of our situation. Like what, what can we, what conclusions can we draw from it? Well, um, I think recognizing what the game is, where the power, where the power lies mm -hmm. and ultimately what would need to happen if we were, if we were to wield that power. Um, that's the real, that's the real question. Um, and I do think that there are signs that at least a few people are playing that game. I mean, we we mentioned Elon Musk several times. Uh, you know, whether he wins or loses in the long term, he at least is playing the right game, right? Yes. I mean, he he captured he did something that we've not seen anybody do. He has captured a rival castle from the regime, at least temporarily, right? Um, I think. Uh, and again, you know, I've been the first one to say that Ron, Ron DeSantis is, I think, a, an agent of containment. I think that his ultimate role um, is pro-regime, by, by which I mean he will get people to have faith in the system again, because ultimately they need people to, you know, die in wars and things like that. Uh, you can't have a situation where half of the population or a third of the population, especially that third of the population which you typically recruit from uh, for the army, you, you can't really have a situation where they're t where they're tapped out and they they just don't trust any of their institutions, right? Like that's unsustainable as a long term as a long term strategy for power. So at some point, I think that they need to make a few concessions, right, or at least be seen to you know, put a few of these woke things away. Um, and this is where I think somebody like Ron DeSantis comes in because, you know, he does a lot of, let's face it, he does a lot of things that people like us agree with, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's ostensibly doing stuff that we want. Would you agree with that? Yep, uh, absolutely. And, and so, and um, I mean, certainly people from Florida that I've met, including yourself and uh, Tho Bishop and various other people, you know, it's the rarest of things, right? A leader who people like say, "Yeah, he's actually all right. He's done, he's done good stuff for us." I don't yeah, actually know of any. I don't actually know of any other examples, like in my yeah, lifetime. Pretty yeah, much. no, I mean, I, I mean, I, I under, I, I get into this all the time because I know this is a very popular position. The one you espouse uh, is very popular, kind of in our circles, and I understand why. Um, but yeah, I mean, in a very direct way, my life was much better over the last few years because of Ron DeSantis. Like, there's just no way of avoiding that. My life would have been much worse had it not been for Ron DeSantis being in power. And that's the kind of thing that actually builds loyalty and builds, uh, you know, gra real support. Um, 
that you that that's organic that you otherwise don't see very often. So I, it, I think it's very understandable that Floridians are, are pretty bullish on him. Yeah, but I mean, at the very least, he is making the right sorts of moves, right? I mm -hmm. saw that he was targeting S, um, the ESG stuff. He went after Disney in a you know in a real way. Um, you know whether whether any of this stuff tra uh, ultimately translates into genuine action or not. You know, um, we, we'll see, I guess. But uh, I mean, he's making the right sorts of noises, which should, you know, at the very least, he's playing the right game, right? He's not but, afraid. He's not, he's not cowed by the ideology of small government conservatism saying we can't involve ourselves in this. We can't ever punish a company for its behavior because we're, we're the small government guys. He, he throws yeah, that convention. To yeah. The and he's, he's also not using the cope lines like, mm -hmm. a, like a, like a cope way would be like, Oh, well, we'll see Disney at the end of the year. You know, how many people want to go to a groomer park or whatever? Like, I mean, he's realistic to, enough to, a, understand that you know people aren't really going to boycott disney in big enough numbers you know i mean I, I think disney own like a fifth or maybe even a quarter of the entire entertainment industry yeah like absolutely. it's just impossible like even me right even me um you know I, I was walking through a toy store the other day and my daughter really wanted the uh the elsa frozen flask right and in that moment i was just like Okay, do I take the next like twenty minutes of her moaning at me for this, or should I just get it? Okay, I, I, I'll get it. But now I've given Disney money. You, you see, that's me. That right? I've given Disney money now, uh, or, or I, I don't know. I want to check out the new Obi Wan series. Okay, I'll give Disney a tenner for the month or whatever. You know, it, it's kind of just. It's, I I think it's really difficult to when companies are that big to not to just not give them any dollar ever. Right. right. I mean, I'm sure there are some principled people who, who manage it, but in the real world, most people aren't going to manage it. It's just too easy to to end up even accidentally giving them money. Right. Right. Uh, in, in some way. Um, I, I should mention this number 12 point hour on which we skipped over a little bit. Sure. Um, th this is actually the leverage that comes with being a massive company. Um, probably the easiest example is the leverage that supermarkets have over farmers. I mean, supermarkets basically dictate the wholesale price of their own supplies. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine you're a family farmer, right? You've got, uh, you know, what is it, Walgreens breathing down your neck. I, You know, Walgreens want the unit price of sausages to be this or chickens to be that. You're going to say no. Yeah, just lose all of that business just to say no to fight for that one price. Like they're not going to go to the guy down the street and get the price from him. Yeah, right. So they they basically have them over a barrel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my my dad my dad worked for the Ford for the Ford Motor Company for many years. I mean, there's basically an entire industry underneath Fords of companies that exist purely to supply Fords. I.e., Fords are their only customer. So what do you think the leverage of Ford is over that? Over over those, buyers? Yeah. I mean, it's like, okay, um, are you going to take her offer then? No? All right, then. We'll go, we'll get our little plastic screws from somewhere else. All right, that's my company gone. So, th so, so there's basically no real, you know, when you get economies of scale that big, there's no real power on one side of the negotiation. Um, you can get it on the other end as well. Uh, imagine you're one of those big supermarkets and you're the procurement manager or whatever. Are you really going to piss off Coca-Cola so that Coca-Cola pull out of all your stores? Right. I mean, it's just not going to happen, right? It's just not that there, there, there's no scenarios in which um, they're going to allow a situation where a, a, a company the size of Coca-Cola pulls its drinks out of all the stores. So, you know, we're talking about the market, right? But it's so much of the market is static, is what I'm saying. It's it's not going to go in. It's ba it's basically like the the market has been frozen in kind of like resin for the past like for all our lives. Basically, what we have is a is a simulation of something that looks like a market. Um, and the reason I mention all of these things um, are. 
even now, even within the face of all of this that I've just said, you're still, even today, I bet you today, at least 100 articles has been published by Cato and Reason, and even sometimes on the Mises Institute. The Mises Institute tend to be better than the others, right? But even on Mises, you'll still see articles um, defending American capitalism and using Fords and Coca-Cola and, you know, just using these massive corporations as examples of kind of the success story of America, right? It's just like, well, I mean, it, are you really defending the free market? I mean, by my description, it sounds like you're defending a centrally run command economy. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, and I, I, I just struggle to, I, str I struggle to come to terms with anybody who lived through COVID, right? Who, who lived through the pandemic and saw how quickly all aspects of the total state walked in lockstep. How can they still maintain these absolute fictions about the world they live in? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, you know, they, they will probably go with you on that, right? They'll say, like, we understand that the government influence is bad and that it's present. Maybe they wouldn't have admitted how present it was until an example like COVID came around. But now they'll say, yeah, it's there. But I think many of them would still say, but the presence of, like, crony capitalism doesn't mean that the free market is still not the the best ideal right that that i think it, and we've talked about why why that's kind of an issue but yeah, i think that I would mean, be the response is like my, well just because yeah. crony capitalism exists doesn't mean that you know you shouldn't be aiming for the free market how are you, how are you going to stop you see here's here's my problem with that in the in the 1940s um and 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 beforehand but i think in the 1940s in particular and the 50s there were a whole laugh, there were a whole raft of antitrust legislations put through uh, by by the government who had this idea that they wanted to stop like these massive firms arising, okay, due to some of these problems that we're talking about. They wanted to kind of protect the mom and pop store, okay? Now at the time, free marketeers were against that, and they're still against antitrust laws, okay? So my question, if you're going to maintain a kind of absolutist free market position is when when you get mass and scale, which is the result of successful capitalism, it was the result of the industrial revolution in this country. It was the it was the result of uh, the so-called Gilded Age in America. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Massive growth, massive economies of scale. How do you stop the emergence of what we describe or what Burnham describes as managerialism, this process that we've been talking through? How do you stop that happening? It, it, especially if you're not prepared to back laws that basically um, nerf certain companies, right? I mean, if you look at those antitrust cases in, in the 40s, I, I've got a book here. Um, uh, I can't remember the, the guy who wrote it, but it's a, it's a libertarian book which goes through very many antitrust cases and argues that these antitrust laws should have been abolished, right? And, and they, they, many of them were abolished later on. But, but many of them were trying to stop this. They were trying to like stop, um, you know, massive corporations leveraging their position in the market to get like cheaper, cheaper kind of unit, unit goods. Now the libertarian would always say, well, yeah, but you screw in the consumer because they they now have to pay like a couple of uh, cents more for wh whatever the salt or whatever happens to be. You're actually like re retarding the operation of the market, they'd say. But what I would say is, what if what if there's another way of looking at the problem, which is you're facilitating by allowing that free reign, you're facilitating exactly what we, we've described here, which is the growth of Leviathan. You get these monsters, and now in 2023, you know we're we're faced with this bearing down on all of us, and it's like, well, you know, I mean, the U.S. government, right? Joe Biden doesn't have to do anything most of the time because his bidding is done for him by every CEO and every massive corporation going. Does anybody right. remember how many of them came out in support of BLM and all these other groups? I mean, this was. You know that this was the, uh, you know, the so-called private sector doing all of this. It wasn't the government doing it? Um, 
you know, you didn't you didn't even need uh, an edict coming down from the government. It all happened kind of, you know, privately, quote unquote. So, what what do you do about that? Yeah, I, I think there's a really difficult truth that a lot of conservatives or people on the right might have to come to, which is that the the economies of scale, the massification, the the Leviathan is a is a huge problem. And assuming that like woke capital is a function of some very recent uh, corruption of kind of the the market system. Um, it, as opposed to kind of an, an inevitable consequence of this kind of centralization of power and, distri and distribution of ideology, I think is is something a lot of people are really uncomfortable thinking about, but they're going to have to start if they're going to grapple with this in any meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, to get any of these solutions, Aaron, you have to you have to wield power, right? Right. I mean, if, if I had, if I had my way, one of the um, great private institutions of America that I would just outright ban are uh, our NGOs. Yeah. Just like private lobby groups. Mm -hmm. You know, what? why Why should, I mean, I don't want to get anybody into trouble, but why should the ADL be allowed to operate and wield the amount of power it does? Oh, it's a free country. Oh, right. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, well, you know, all of these things exist too, and this is all part of a free society to have uh, private organizations kind of uh, lobbying and telling people how to run their lives. Yeah, exerting so, massive influence yeah, through on, on speech, as we've seen on a regular basis. All right, well, let's go ahead and hit these um, super chats real quick before you've got to run over to your channel and get your show started. So uh, falling outside normal constraints here for $2, the Blaze to Elite Theory Pipeline is operational. Yep, absolutely. Here, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> C123, uh, $2, capitalism ho, more like capitalism no. Uh, <laughs> have, have you completely in, uh, abandoned the idea of capitalism, uh, uh, academic agent? Is that, no, is that no, what's no, happening? I mean, no, some of the some of the fundamentals about um, re resource allocation, price signals, you know, M Mises one hundred one hundred stuff. You know, there's a reason. There's a reason why the Soviet Union like sucked as badly as it did, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I, I I'm not saying. Um, I'm not saying that markets can't achieve anything or there can't be little pockets of free market here or there. What I'm what I'm pointing out is that the reality of what we live under is actually a lot closer to the Soviet Union than it is to um, than it is to anything approaching the free market. And that the free market in and of itself gives rise to this almost inevitably. It's like I I, I just I don't see a scenario where you don't get the state deciding, well, we're going to provide the startup capital for this because, one, we have enough money. We're the only people who've got enough money to do this. Um, and two, we need it for X, Y, and Z to be more competitive than China or more competitive than Russia or whatever. Um, and, I mean, this is, this is probably something that is beyond the scope of this stream, but I have had some thoughts sometimes. It's like, well... We have to look at the actual data that's come in, the evidence, right? I mean, China's been pretty successful on its state-backed model. Um, South Korea was pretty damn successful on its state-backed model. Um, Great Britain, after after embracing laissez-faire, basically destroyed its industrial sector in 50 years after being the world leader. Uh, America, after going all out... Uh, neoliberal destroyed its industrial sector and created the rust belt uh and lost tons of jobs to china i mean at, at what point do we just stick with a kind of dogma that says oh well you know complete free market is um is the best versus the actual facts which are in the space of 30 years china went from being you know wherever they were 30 years ago to the second second biggest economy in the world, if not the first biggest economy in the world now, right? 
Huh. Sure. They, they've also manufactured some big issues for themselves down the line, though, too. And, and there's big questions about whether China's economy can even do what it did without the presence of, of something like America to create the market for, for that to. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, think of how stupid that is. Oh, yeah, we're going to freely trade with we're going to freely trade goods with uh, with China. We're going to we're going to create a, an absolute monster rival. Oh yeah, yeah, no, well, America. Oh, yeah, we might fail. We might it, yeah. fail one day. Well, how about not fucking doing it in the first place? <laughs> sure. so, so, sorry, but you know, you understand what I'm yeah, saying. It's like, I well, do. you know, they didn't have to, and and th th this is this is another way of thinking about it, which is that when you're a global hegemon, as the British Empire was at one point, um, laissez-faire is a very effective tool of control. Mm -hmm. Because it brings other countries, uh, even if they're reluctant, into your sphere of influence and into your network. Okay, yes. and if they resist that, you can always bring the gunboat boats out, which is what the British actually did in practice. Okay, yeah, you know, if you resist China, there's the opium wars to come. Okay, yeah. you will become part of our network. Okay, but the problem is, is that once you actually start living by free trade it's like well yeah but they are going to follow the logic of the cheapest good right the cheapest labor market you are going to lose out to the less developed nation because the jobs are going to go i mean this is, we've seen this process and it's the same thing with america when america was the global hegemon it became like in the 19th century, America was not a laissez faire nation. It was a very protectionist nation, as Steve Bannon will tell you over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. When it became the hegemon, it then became ad advantageous to say, well, well, now we're running the network. Now we, we want you in our free trade network, right? Which, which works until it doesn't work because you're basically creating the next monster. And that's. You know, that's what's happened over and over again. In, in a strange way, America was the bloody monster creation of British laissez-faire. Um, when they passed the Corn Laws, if you, you can read all about this in my, uh, even though it's a defense of the free market, you can actually still see the underlying data in, in the Defenders of Liberty. When, when they repealed the Corn Laws, it basically destroyed British agriculture, all like hundreds of farms, Probably like eighty percent of the agricultural economy went tits up, basically, and all of the corn, wheat, 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 we'd say now, um, and various other goods were imported into Britain from where, from America. Right. So the the uh, America became like a kind of agricultural powerhouse in the nineteenth century, largely thanks to the death of British ag agriculture. Which was afforded by what? There's a fair. So you, you, you can see, you know, in a strange way, Britain then helped build America up and then America took over Britain. Many such cases. All right. So Ed here for $5. Uh, conservatives refuse to realize that the game uh, Checkers turned into a game of Rochambeau decades ago. Yep, absolutely. Thank you very much for your donation. Always kind of. Uh, not understanding where they are, what time it is, has, has unfortunately been a feature of, of conservative politics for many years. Uh, general grievance for $5. I just spent six grand getting my truck fixed, but I'm not in the poorhouse yet. So here's a five. Keep up the good work, bro. Well, thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. I hope uh, be better luck with your truck at this point due to the weird. Uh, it, are cars still appreciating the way they were before? Where like it's it's it was uh like used cars kept going up and up it was very uh odd is it is that still happening is that phenomenon still going on i i have no idea but um, i'm not sure i'm just about to buy my car outright i've i got my car on uh, what do they call it higher purchase years ago and now it's run out is and that I like a to... lease is that... like yeah like a lease thing okay. um, it, it's a full i got it like a special deal from my dad so it was yeah, like okay. you know like massive discount or whatever using your nepotism yes yeah but now he's now he's retired and i don't get the deal uh, anymore okay. so i'm just gonna buy it i'm just gonna buy it outright so hopefully yes hopefully it keeps on appreciating because i i don't i don't want my uh they're gonna they said they're gonna ban cars by 2030 or something didn't they so 
Yes, yeah, no, California has been talking about that. No gas-powered cars uh, by 2030. Uh, James here uh, for five pounds says, is the Anglosphere particularly damaged by multiculturalism due to common law? No shared morality, no shared values. Law cannot function. What do you think about that, uh, AA, the Anglosphere damaged due to common law, not able to resist uh, multiculturalism? Um. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I have a this controversial idea that culture is downstream from law, right? Mm -hmm. um, my, I mean, I understand all the arguments for common law. My sense has always been from reading Hayek and others. Um, the immediate question I have is like, well, how do you stop what Americans call judicial activism? All you all you'd need is one activist judge, and they basically have created a new precedent. So. To me, it's uh, too easy to game. It's too easy to game common law. Because you just, you do, all you need is one activist judge, and that's it. You're buggered. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see here. Uh, Bella Phosphorus Knight for $2. America does love its managers. Just ask Hamilton. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Hamilton Jeffersonian showdown never, never really went away. We're, we're still. We're still doing the Federalist anti Federalist dance, but the uh, the Federalist won pretty handily, so it's kind of a, a ghost dance in many ways. But you're right but about that. I, I tell you what's a really good book on Hamilton in particular is that Patrick Deneen book, the uh, it's called After Liberalism or something. I can't remember what it's called now. The, the, oh, uh, the, the, why the, liberalism failed. Failed, yeah. Uh, he, he's particularly good on the Federalists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his theory that the Federalists always intended for the state to grow. Kind of quite right. convincing, actually. Quite convincing. Yeah. I think that's a fair point. Uh, let me track down our next one here. Sorry, guys. Lots of chat trying to make sure I'm getting everybody. Uh, Sean Weiland for four ninety nine. Thank you very much, sir. Credit from the total state crowds out uh, genuine uh, profit seeking. This is why my forthcoming book. Uh, this is what my forthcoming book covers, and what I deal with daily in exit planning. Uh, all right, uh, Sean. Yep, yeah, if you've got a book coming out, you should definitely. Thanks for letting everybody know. Uh, let's see. Credit. Yep, fair enough. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you very much. Hunting down super chats. While I'm hunting down the next one, can you uh, let anyone who's familiar who or unfamiliar with your stuff? I'm sure most people know, but. Can you tell people where to go to find your stuff? Yeah, if you go to uh, Academic Agent on YouTube, you'll find all my stuff there. You can also go, uh, I sell courses. It's the main way I make my living uh, these days. Top quality courses um, at the Academic Agency. I'm actually doing a sale at the moment. If you use promo code SHAWJAN, SHAWJAN, um, you'll get 25% off all courses. So do pick up a course uh, that will help me out a good bit. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. We got uh, Pablo uh, Panish and uh, I think those are pesos. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure how much that translates to, but I appreciate it. Uh, Peter Thiel famously said, uh, you can't be profitable in a free, uh, uh, free competition market. Competition is for losers. Similar to people who want to be left alone, will lose against those who want to win. Yeah, I think uh, pretty much all of the famous uh, American capitalists kind of knew the same thing, right? Com competition is the enemy. The thing you want to do is, uh, you know, vertically integrate or, or as whatever as much as possible to completely strangle out the opportunity of of others to compete. That That's what winning looks like in the system. There, there isn't really another path to victory. Um, I think, uh, f as most people understand it, and if the state is a useful tool for that, um, or is the dictator of who wins that game, then that's the one you kind of have to bend to at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes they get so good at it that you can only just, sometimes I just have to sit back and admire them. Um, the example I give is Amazon, Aaron, and Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, I think, is basically gamed capitalism to the point where he's just won because amazon is not only a platform but is also a player in the market right so it has more or less perfect information it can see what everybody's buying through its third-party sellers 
and then if it sees a winner it can then be like well we can make that for cheaper so and then it can just if, if anything starts to make it amazon can just step in and do it themselves or they'll just buy the company that's doing well they have perfect information they have sought they have almost like i don't want to say they've like solved the musician calculation problem but they have um that they've managed to create a situation where they can only ever win as long as people use amazon of course but uh which they will and and things like the pandemic will continue to assure that they you know only gain in their in their market share and their it, power it, it, when i say perfect information ryan what i mean is amazon has hundreds thousands and thousands of third party sellers right. who sell goods through amazon as a platform right amazon can see all of the data that they're, they're an they're, they're as well as being being a online platform they're an analytics company and they get all of the analytics for free they can yes. see it because they own that they are amazon right they see everything but at the same time they make stuff too and sell it so i don't know let's say i don't know this particular teddy bear is doing well right some some guy has started their own company and they started selling teddy bears through amazon and they and they start really taking off amazon can see thousands millions of people buying this teddy bear they and then they're like well either we can just make them an offer to own the teddy bear business outright or they can just start making their own version of it i mean it's just weird like there's just no way that they lose yeah. and then you know because they can what i'm saying is they don't have to take the risk of of testing goods on the market because other people are doing that for them they yeah. all they can see is well this, that's a winner we'll just replicate the winner and all these people are basically paying them for the privilege of giving them the data that then allows them to put them out of business yeah it is remark is it is remarkable uh, yeah yeah so Matty Ice here for ten dollars. He says, "What is the primary method by which the left can ob uh, obscure how much business operates in its interests and vice versa? The degree which progressives earnestly think that the R counterculture is a feature. Uh, I mean, I think they did this for as long as it was necessary, right? Like, and they still get a lot of cultural momentum out of this um, by being able to kind of uh, refer to kind of this legacy idea." that uh, these companies are all conservative republican whatever of course they also again benefit from the uh from the ratchet the leftward cultural ratchet so even if um you know apple and and uh you know procter and gamble are declaring their woke bona fides they could still always not be sufficiently left wing right so that what was a conservative company you know 20 years ago uh would now be like a you know a fascist company today at this point, right? Like they're just so far away from uh, from the radical left that uh, in any minor uh, lag behind kind of the NPC download, the latest update will make you uh, conservative by comparison. So I think they can keep this up for, for a while, though there are some people on the left who are kind of disillusioned with this, but not enough. It's still an amazingly effective thing. But, I mean, I don't want to go on too long, but I, I, actually, I actually disagree with... Um... Curtis Yarvin and various people on this, and we've okay. kind of argued about it before. I don't think the left is in control. I think the left, the, the true left, were owned. Basically, they were just con like completely humiliated and owned um, after Occupy Wall Street. You know, you, you, I'm sure you've seen that graph before of the instances sure. of the word racism after 2010. You know, it just skyrockets. Yep. Um, I think they've been utterly contained and. Now they are now committed, uh, you know, committed Marxists and so on are reduced to cheerleading Disney as they groom children. I mean, you know, yeah. they have been, they're, they're being, we we like to say they, they'll wear your uh, institution as a skin suit, right? But mm. I also think the left have been worn as a skin suit, the true left. Um, uh, but because leftists tend to be Machiavellian and evil, they just like power enough that they'll just run with it anyway. You know, I'm thinking like Vouch types, for example. Yeah. 
So. Yeah, I guess it would. We'd have to get deep into like what the left is and break all that down. So that that mm-hmm. might be uh, too. Like you said, that might go on too long. But uh, I do understand your point there. There, I I would point to Sam Francis's analysis about kind of the vanguard left being, uh, you know, basically the managerial uh, elite catching up with the vanguard left and kind of mm-hmm. how how that has synthesized those two movements. But uh, but yeah, that may, may be a topic for another time because that one could go for a while. Uh, Ed for four ninety nine. Are there any regional solutions taxing corporate products at the state level to support more local production? Um, I've got some thoughts here, but regional solutions uh, for for kind of these economic regulations. What do you think? It, yeah, but it'll only, it'll only really be small scale, and you have to keep it small scale. Otherwise, you start getting all this problem again. This, this yeah. is the issue: is like there's no scalable solution to this. Because the issue is the scale. Is the scale, yeah. Nope, I think I think that's that's largely right. Uh, Mano, sorry, I'm going to say this horribly wrong. Mano Fal- Falmus, uh, thank you for your donation. Yes, Gutter Ballet, excellent uh, album. If you have not listened to uh, Sabotage, uh, you should fix that immediately. Uh, excellent band. Uh, Evermite here for uh, $10, $10 Canadian. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Didn't have a... a question there but i appreciate the donation uh let's see uh machiavellius to go 199 need a white caesar yeah i mean normally you hear people red or blue caesar i think there will probably you know caesarism is the expected uh coming for a lot of a lot of this stuff of people from the oswald spangler on to probably curtis yarvin uh, you can probably say expect Caesar in one one form or another. So it is the solution that a lot of people think, or maybe not the solution, but is the inevitable outcome of kind of the situation. I mean, I, I'm currently writing my next book, Aaron, which is called Prophets of Doom, mm-hmm. which is all about Spengler and people like Arnold Toynbee and Vico and various other people who have talked about cyclical history and challenged the notion of progress or the myth of progress. Um One slight black pill I've realized while writing this book is that the age of Caesarism may have come and gone already. Think so? It's like it's like the era of Caesarism may have been from Napoleon to like the death of Stalin, say, right, or the death of Franco. Maybe was the last Caesar, right? Because it's it's meant to be like a two hundred year block, right. And then one possible outcome in Spengler is just the endless stasis just goes on, just goes on for like a really long time. Right. I mean, you know, just laps into the, the thing. China is one of the, yeah, uh, he gives China as an example, but like, I mean, there are, there are moments where I've been so black pill right in that book that I just have to like stop and take a walk and things like that. But uh, well, you are writing a book called prophets of doom. So yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) it's kind of implicit. I mean, uh, I really hope we don't have that future because yeah, would, me too. You know, I can't take another twenty years of this, especially not at a global scale. Uh, that that's about it's about one one thing for it to be a, a particular civilization somewhere in the globe. It's another thing to be the thing that dominates the globe. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, uh, Creep, creeper weirdo for five dollars. So what was the uh, so was this what your last uh, ideology video was? Oh, against ideology. Yes, your video about against I- ideology. Is this what the video was about? Uh, no, 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 not really. Um, all I was saying there is that ideology is a function of power in and of itself. And if you're not in power, um, if you're not in power, your ideology is just hot air, basically. The only ideology that actually functions as ideology is... Um, arguments basically that uh justify what power is doing at the moment right Mm -hmm. um and if you think about most ideologies they come from post hoc rationalization of power or they put it for shorthand uh bs bs therefore we rule or bs bs therefore our course of action was correct um and uh, I mean, the, the arch master of this was uh, was was Tony Blair, as as uh, people were the probably sick, yeah. sick, to, sick of me pointing out. But uh, <laughs> I mean, when he was the prime minister, he continually did things 
and then people would come up with the arguments for why they were done after he'd done them. It's like, uh, it's already happened. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, here's why. And and you actually, you see this a lot in the writing style of our opponents. Um, I don't know if you ever read like a Vice magazine or, uh, uh, I can't remember what they're all called now. Like, yeah, like Pink Slate. News, or, yeah, Slate. So, or, yeah. um, they're always like, they always have the headline, blah, 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 blah. Here's why. Yes. Right. Here's why. You, well, they're basically justifying power nine times out of ten. Yeah. They, they are coming up with the argument after the fact to justify what was done. This actually started to happen under Trump as well. I mean, I, I would say that 90% of discourse in 2018 were various commentators post hoc justifying actions that Trump had done through 4Ds, 64D chess, or whatever it was. Do you remember all that? Oh, come on. Bill Whittle's a, is, is a saint. It's okay. <laughs> like, that's... So it's I mean, all planned is, from the top, you know. This is this is Patriots what people are in do. control. Like yeah. men of action act, right? Or do stuff, and then intellectuals like justify what they've done. Right? Yep. Um wh what we want our on is for our guys to be in power, right? And then we'll be like, well, here's why Ron DeSantis did this or whatever, but we're not. We're very, very far away from having friends in power. Uh, DeSantis, yeah. first of his name. This is this is why he uh <laughs> Right about the, the Dominion of Florida. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So Pablo here again with Pesos. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Uh, Bitcoin question. Uh-oh. This is See, this is what happens. It, it Bitcoin enters the chat, and all of a sudden, this is the only thing that uh, people comment on. <laughs> Bitcoiners who are anti-other coins and our followers of Hans Hermann Hava claim that Bitcoin price signal is the only free market uh, there is because it's the most decentralized. Have you looked into this, AA? No. <laughs> <laughs> no i i've, I've just, learned just refusing I, to go to the bitcoin i just, uh, I've just learned over many years don't talk about bitcoin whatever you say about bitcoin you'll be wrong and violently so uh from <laughs> from whichever side had said it yeah that's been my experience too uh, i do my best it's obviously an important thing in some ways but yeah it seems like it's always a losing issue Sorry about it. We don't have a, my, a deeper my, answer for you, Pablo. My, my dream is to be around long enough that I'm, I start shilling gold there on. That will happen yeah. eventually, right? One, one day, one day. Uh, <laughs> Radlib can tell you about the war on gold. We had him on just last week for that. Uh, glow in the dark here for $2. Uh, most pro capitalist misattribute uh, cause and effect. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's probably true of most people uh, most of the time. But yes, there are many, more, many people who as I've said this, this is one of the very first uh, videos I made guys. And, and, and I still hold to this, uh, you know, I talked about, you know, capitalism isn't a suicide pact. And this is my, the same position I have now. Capitalism is great when it does great things for your country, when it does great things for the people, when it benefits the lives of the people uh, that you're supposed to care about. And, you know, as far as I can tell, the system that we call capitalism seems better at doing that than things like, you know, communism, uh, or at least, you know, the cartoon version of communism that most people are referencing when they're talking about it. But that doesn't mean that it's the only, that it's good in and of itself. I mean, capitalism is not a moral good all by its lonesome. When it does good things, it should be praised. And when it creates serious problems for society, it has to be acknowledged. I, I think that that's a really difficult thing for a lot of conservatives here. But I think it's just the case. That doesn't mean I think we should embrace communism or anything. I think that's stupid. But I don't think it means we should sit there and just be ideologically purity spiraling, spiraling about capitalism. I don't think that helps either. That's a very sensible incentive position, Aaron. Yeah, we try to keep the sen sen uh, sensible center uh, always our eye on the sensible center here. Uh, congratulations on coining that term, by the way. It blew up immediately. So that was that was great. <laughs> Uh, Ed, we you've got my last super chat, and for some reason it's not. Sh oh, there it is. Found it. Here we go. Uh, Ed says, "So what A is saying is that Amazon perfected what China's been doing for decades." Um, yeah, but they probably did it better than China. Yeah, well, that's what he said. Perfected. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you guys very much for coming by. I know that Academic Agent has to swing over to un, uh, Unpopular Opinion, so head over to his channel right now. Make sure that you buy his book if you haven't already, Populist Delusion. It's a great book. Uh, thank you all so much for coming by. Had a huge audience. Really appreciate everybody. Good questions. And of course, uh, Academic Agent, thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, cheers. We're actually going to be discussing a bit of, uh, I don't know if I would call it drama, but we're going to be discussing the um, Peter Hitchens versus Sargon of Akkad showdown saga, on Twitter this week, yeah. uh, which has been, I mean, I don't know about you, but I find it all a bit sad, to be honest. Because I, kind it, of... it is very sad. Yeah, I want to like Hitchens, um, and it's it's very sad to see him be so short sighted in his interactions. Uh, that's a big shame. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me, Aaron. Buy, buy Populist Illusion. Buy my courses. Buy it now. Chill, 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 chill. Yes. Uh, Ankush, capitalism uh, ho. Marula, capitalism thing. ho. Capitalism ho. I love Not capitalism. Market. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming by. And as always, we'll talk to you next time.